Welcome in to Real Deal Sports Talk with me, KP. It's Wednesday night, November 30th, 2016. You don't have anything to do. You're tuning in. You're joining me. We're going to talk sports. We're going to have a good time. Everything's going to be real. Thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. Um, glad to be here with everybody today. Work week's going good. I hope your week's going good. Hope everything's good in your world, as good as it can be. Uh, remember, everything could always be worse, and it can always get better. So uh, with that being said, we got a lot to talk about. There was a lot to pick and choose from, for sure, for tonight's show. Um, and I tried to put together a good one for you. We'll see how that turns out. I uh, hope everybody likes it. If not, you know, get at me. Let me know. Let me know what I messed up, just like when I messed up on the Conor McGregor thing, and somebody let me know about it. Um, but, yeah. You know, let's get into some stories, huh? I'm going to start with a defensive story. This is a guy I've been hard on. I've talked, not down upon, but I haven't jumped on the bandwagon. I haven't anointed him uh, to the level that some people have. Uh, However, with that being said, he is making great strides. He is a beast of an athlete. Uh, He has all the skill set to dominate at his position. And... The guy I'm talking about achieved something on Sunday that hadn't been achieved since Charles Woodson did it. The guy I'm talking about plays for the Oakland Raiders. The guy I'm talking about wears number 52 on his chest. The guy I'm talking about is Khalil Mack. Now, again, I've been hard on Khalil Mack. I think the media, I think the league put him on a pedestal way too early, especially last year when he got uh, first team at two different positions, all pro. Unwarranted, in my opinion. Most of what he did to achieve that statistically was against one team in one game. A good portion of it. The Denver Broncos made Khalil Mack last season. They put him in a position to be near the league lead in sacks and look more dominant. You take away his game against Denver, or Denver has an average game, or even a below average game, not a horrendous game. Let's say they give up two sacks. Not a good game, right? Not horrendous, but not a good game. Well, they gave up like seven in that game, five of which went to Khalil Mack. They made him last season. He finished with 15 and a half. He had seven in the two games against Denver. Okay? That's a that first that jumps off the page at you. You have to see that. Now, everybody wanted to say he was the best. Everybody wanted to talk about how dominant it was. Yes, he has that ability. He flashes that ability. What he did Sunday with an interception, a touchdown, a forced fumble, a sack and a fumble recovery in the same game, you now have my respect, young man. Charles Woodson is one of the players I fully respect. Loved his game. I thought he was a cocky dude coming out of Michigan. Uh, I thought fitting in in Oakland was the perfect spot for him to start his career and kind of break his teeth in the NFL. And when he left Oakland, I really, really wanted him to come back to Michigan and play for the Lions. Instead, he went to Green Bay, became Defensive Player of the Year, won a Super Bowl, and then went back to where he started in Oakland. Great career for Charles Woodson. Fully respect his game. Fully respect Cleo Max game. He is making great strides at becoming that dominant defensive player that everybody has already made him into being. He's now not just flashing it. He's now continuously doing it. He's now drawing those double and triple teams. Teams aren't so worried about Irvin on the other side. They're worried about Khalil Mack now. Not at the same level like Von Miller yet, but close. Not at the same level really as even Ndamukong Sue, but close. He would be in that second tier right now. If J.J. Watt comes back healthy and he's J.J. Watt, he's still a first-tier guy. He's up in that tier. Khalil Mack right now, for me, 
second tier guy making great strides, doing big things. So good job, Cleo Mack. Good job, uh, Reggie McKenzie, getting him in the draft and for rebuilding that team. Jack Del Rio, I still don't think you deserve any credit for what's going on there. Sorry, um, I lost respect for you after what happened here in Denver. All right, moving on. Monday Night Football. You had Aaron Rodgers disappearing into a tent on the sideline with a trainer. Everybody went all crazy on social media. What's he doing? What's the tent for? You know, making up all kinds of stories. It makes sense to have a tent on the sideline. It would be nicer if the tent was a little bigger. Um, that was awkward looking. It was a little weird. And as we came to learn, they needed privacy. They needed to check his injury or add the pad that all of a sudden showed up uh, on his hamstring. And that's a good place to be able to drop trow, get a quick, you know, fix up, and not have to go all the way back to the locker room, have the cameras on you, have people running stories, have the whole stadium look at you, have your team wondering what's going on. Instead, they go, oh, he's in the tent. He's getting taped up or he's got to, you know, take a deuce or uh, take a pee. All those things have been reported as to what happens in those tents. So that's all it was. No big deal. You know, nothing weird going on. Anybody see Tom Brady try and make a block against the Jets? That Garrett Blunt run? I'm sure you've seen the video. People have said, oh, he almost took out three guys. He almost took out six guys. Okay, have fun with it. I get that. But watch the, watch the play. It's pitiful. It's really sad. You have to laugh. He comes around the end as LeGarrette Blunt, Blunt cuts back and comes around, acting like he's going to run up and you know catch a block. And he didn't even really try and get in the way. Once the Jets' defenders showed up, he kind of curled up his upper body and started tiptoeing through them, hoping they didn't blast his ass. It, I mean, don't even run over there. That was pitiful. You're a football player. You may play quarterback. The rules may be set up for you. But don't go over there, curl into a ball, and tiptoe through the defensive backfield. I mean, that was just... You weren't even really... You didn't slow anybody down. You didn't touch anybody. You didn't block anybody. And who knows? Maybe Le Garrett Blunt wanted to be running where you were. And now, you know, it's just another thing they can dog on you about, which is whatever. Um... You're still, you know, a top candidate for the MVP, so you got to give him that. He tied Peyton Manning for most career wins at 200, so he's going to break that record this year. And he joined the 60,000-yard passing club. So he's, regardless of how silly that was, and we all want to make fun of him, and I'm sure his teammates dogged him out a little bit too afterwards. Um, I would have if I was his teammate. Got him some ballet shoes or something. Nothing against ballet. I've tried that. That stuff's hard. Um, but, you know, you got to rag him somehow. Okay, moving on. Another uh, Bart Scott. Bart Scott loved to talk as a player, right? Loved to talk, loved to be vocal, loved to talk smack on the field, get in guys' faces, be loud, um, all that kind of stuff. Now we all know he's been working for CBS. Uh, I haven't really liked him so far in CBS. This is for sure his best season um, with them. But now he's you know getting his opinion out there again, and he uh, CBS Sports reports Bart Scott talking about you know Gronkowski is probably on his way out in New England, and he points to the fact of the injuries and the cost and how New England doesn't really keep guys around once they spot or see that they're diminishing in skills or that they're slipping. He's got a good point. That is how New England runs. He is high priced. He is having back injuries and rib injuries and multiple broken arms and hamstrings and he's a big dude who takes a big pounding. Bart Scott might not be that far off on this one. I know it would shock everybody. Whoa, Gronkowski got released or Gronkowski got traded. 
Now, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It might not happen this off season. It might happen after next season, though. He's already missed games, what, twice this season? Three times this season due to injury? Multiple seasons in his seven-year career? Could happen. When he's healthy, he's dominant. Nobody better. But man, does he get hit. And people love to hit him as hard as they can because he's a big dude. I mean, look at Earl Thomas. That hit is messing Gronkowski up. So, he might not be wrong. And then he, he goes off on another tangent, another story, talking about the Jags, saying they'd be at least 6-5 and five had they started Chad Henney instead of 2-9 and nine right now. Maybe so. Brodos is not developing as a quarterback. The coaches there are failing him. He had tools. He had a skill set. They're not using it. They're not play calling to what he did best coming out of college. They're not developing him. And sure, he's putting up a lot of touchdown numbers, but he's putting up a lot of interception numbers as well. A lot of his yards come in trash time where they have to throw the ball to get back in games. The running game didn't take off like I thought it would this year. That young defense, a lot of talent, but they still haven't come together as a group playing NFL football. Would they be 6-5 and five with Chad Henney? Maybe. I do think Henney was the better quarterback when they turned the team over to Bortles. Uh, I think Henney's kind of gotten a raw deal. Now, he's if he was a starting quarterback in the NFL, he'd be a third or fourth tier guy. Not a top flight starter at all. But better than what you're getting from Bortles, for sure. So, you know, two good points there from Bart Scott. Uh, one more thing, then we're going to hit break. On the other side of the break, we'll talk some uh, college, f a little bit of college football, and then we'll get back into NFL action. Uh, we'll have the good, the bad, the ugly. We'll get real at the end of the show. And we still have uh, the division leaders and who will end up as division leaders coming up as well. But um, Brock Osweiler, we all know all the talk. I've talked about it multiple times on this show that the Texans were going to get what they paid for, given $72 million, $18 million a year, $35 million guaranteed, I believe, to Brock Osweiler for his seven-game performance last year for the Denver Broncos. And I've said this multiple times, and I'll say it again. Brock Osweiler just didn't lose them games. He did very little to help them win any of the games in that seven game stretch where they went seven and two. I mean five and two. He didn't put up big numbers. He wasn't super efficient. He didn't have amazing touchdown to interception ratio. He just didn't screw up very much. Which was a big turnaround last season with the amazing defense after Peyton Manning threw seventeen interceptions in his first five starts. Or four starts, whatever he had before he came back against San Diego. So yeah, it looked great when all of a sudden you don't have three interceptions a week. But if you really looked at it, Osweiler wasn't playing well. He clearly wasn't a top level NFL quarterback. But Super Bowls bring out money. And the Houston Texans and that owner who didn't even allow his coaches to meet the guy, to talk to the guy, to see if he would fit into what they do, went out, gave him a bunch of money, signed him to a contract, and now they're getting it. And right now, Brock Osweiler's passer rating, okay, his 72.2 passer rating is lower than these former Houston Texans quarterbacks that they've gotten rid of in their search for quarterback, okay? Ryan Fitzpatrick had a 95.3 rating while he played in Houston.